Most people, deep down, are pretty decent. You know, that we are actually a product of what scientists call survival of the friendliest, which literally means that for millennia, it was not the nastiest, not the people who were the most selfish. No, it was the friendliest among us who had the most kids and had the biggest chance of passing on their genes for the next generation. Now, this new view of human nature, this hopeful view, has massive implications for our lives. What you assume in other people is what you get out of them. So if you assume that most people deep down are just selfish, how are you going to organize your company if you're a CEO, right? How are you going to organize social security or the criminal justice system as a government, right? What you assume in other people is what you get out of them. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so my big argument is an argument for trust. If we assume that people are naturally creative and playful and actually want to contribute, then that's exactly the kind of behavior we're going to elicit. And that's why it's so important to change our view of humanity. One of the most interesting questions you can ask as a researcher or a scientist is, what makes human beings special? Why have we conquered the globe? I mean, why not the bonobos or the chimpanzees or the Neanderthals? And the Neanderthals were pretty smart as well, right? They actually have bigger brains than us. So why us? Why not them? And the explanation that scientists now give is self-domestication. We have domesticated ourselves. We're a little bit like sheep and cows, so we're the product of a long evolutionary process where we have tamed ourselves. We have become more friendly. We've become better at cooperating. And this is the secret of our success. It's not that we're so smart. It's not that we're so selfish or powerful or nasty or devious or whatever. No, it is our friendliness. It's our ability to work together. Hmm. So the short summary of my thesis would be, most people are pretty decent, but power corrupts. Power is this incredibly dangerous drug. And neurologists have actually shown this in their brain scans, right? If you study people who are under the influence of power, they become less empathetic. Humans are naturally a mirroring species, right? We imitate each other all the time. I start yawning like, oh, and you do it as well. Um, but the powerful do so much less, right? It's a little bit like they're disconnected from the Wi-Fi that the rest of us are on, right? So that's why I think it's very important to continuously strive for e equality and inclusion and democracy, because that brings people together and, and counters the corruptive effects of power. A lot of people have the mistaken view that those who are not wearing masks or those who are not getting vaccinated are selfish. This is absolute nonsense. If you actually study the people who do not want to be vaccinated, you'll discover that they're driven by, you know, very authentic opinions and ideologies and ideas, and that they're actually part of certain groups, and they don't want to let their groups down, right? So they often do it actually out of loyalty, out of friendship. They're even willing to endanger their own lives by not getting vaccinated, just because they think their own identity and that their membership of a certain group is more important. So if you then start saying, oh, they don't show enough solidarity or they're just too selfish, then you're, you're getting it wrong completely. So that's, I think, a worrying phenomenon uh, also in Austria, you know, where one group starts blaming the other. I think what's much more difficult but also more courageous is actually to extend a hand and say, can we actually have a conversation about this? Because I don't think you're a bad person. We just have different views, but we got to get through this together. Now, how are we going to do that? Well, we have this great experiment called Twitter, and Twitter scientifically established that shouting at people is not very effective if you want to change their minds, right? <laughs> so uh, we desperately got to learn from that, but it's difficult, right? It takes courage. Very often we think that um, approaching someone in a sort of arrogant way or in a very, I don't know, strong or aggressive way, that that is... I don't know, the manly thing to do or something like that, the courageous thing to do. It's the opposite. It's actually humbleness that is often much more courageous. But it's, it, you have to fight against your own intuitions because we just, we really like our own opinions, don't we? Well, I think if we look at the greatest waste in our modern economies, it's the waste of talent. So many super smart and talented people are doing jobs that don't contribute anything of value. It's, you know, the former math withs who worked at Facebook and said that the best minds of my generation are thinking about how to make people click on ads. It's just a really tragic thing if I also look at my generation. 
um, we got to turn that around because we cannot afford that. We're living in an era of extraordinary crisis, whether it's climate change or the extinction of species. We've got to radically transform the whole economy to make it sustainable for the next generation. So that is the greatest waste that is going on. And I think that a basic income will actually help us to reduce that waste because it will free people and enable people to do something that they think is actually important, that actually contributes something to society. But it all starts with updating your view of human nature. So many people don't believe in it because they think people are just selfish. So we got to start there. We got to start at looking at other humans in a different way. I believe that right now we're living in the most important century in the history of humanity. On the one hand, we've made extraordinary progress. If you look at some of the basic metrics, child mortality has gone down massively. Extreme poverty has plummeted, right? The vaccination rate for terrible diseases like measles, for example, has gone up a huge amount since the 1980s. So I'm 33 right now. In the last 30 years, we've made incredible progress in many respects. But then some other things are really, really worrying. You know, I, as I said, I'm 33. And during my lifetime, more than half of all carbon was emitted that we've emitted during the whole industrial age since the 18th century. We're talking about the extinction of species. We're in the middle of the sixth extinction, right? Um, and some other challenges, synthetic biology, the rise of artificial intelligence. We're really living um, at what the philosopher Toby Ort calls the precipice, right? This is the determining time. It's an extraordinary time to be alive. So I would ask everyone who watches this is really think of hard about how you want to spend your one precious life on this earth in this particular century, because it really matters. It really matters what work, uh, what you work on and which problems you focus on. And I think that if we assume the best in each other, that is an enormously important start, right? And then maybe we can tackle these extraordinary chances.